Uh, my name is Vijay, like you know, I'm a director in uh, Capital One. I do take care of like a couple of uh, tech and business initiatives. And uh, Hi, uh, my name is Maharshi and I'm a master software engineer for our Capital One. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So uh, today we are talking about uh, how did we build a solution that could actually scale to the billions of transactions, right? And uh, how we were able to like you know, make it happen uh, with like you know a simple AWS services. So all we are here is like not to sell any product or anything, like, but just a pattern and then the architecture and how we were able to successfully implement that one uh, to be able to like you know, handle the large volume of the data. So let's start with our like you know the simple question like how many of you really check your statements? How many of you do you know like you know what kind of transactions are happening on your card? Awesome. So we have some like you know we do actually check often, but how many times do we consistently check? Do we know like you know all the transactions that are happening in your account are really valid transactions, right? So most of the time. Uh, I'm not talking about those fraudulent transactions, right? A lot of times the banks decline those fraudulent transactions. Once you know that you know, they are coming from, let's say, an unknown place, unknown territories, and so on. But I'm talking about like you know, a very seemingly valid transactions. You go to a restaurant, you have a nice um, meal there, you you basically like you know tip that person. Maybe you write like you know some you know ten dollar, twenty dollar, but the the handwriting is not good. And then somebody like you know puts that uh, tip amount to be like thirty eight dollar, forty dollar, right? So, and uh, typically like you know if you tend to let's say fifteen twenty percent tip, and then this this happens to be around forty percent tip or so, we alert such things, right? So it's essentially like you know we want as uh, from a capital loan point of view, we want to actually look after the customers back. Uh, looking at from the data engineering uh, transactions profile, we want to find out those those small transactions which are seemingly valid. But like you know, you tend to miss them up, right? Those are the things that you know we are trying to alert here. So there are a lot of such scenarios, whether it's the uh, you know the bartender swipes your transaction multiple times versus the uh, you know the tip that you paid, or maybe like you know your kid is actually spending a lot on the Apple Store and and iTunes and you know, so on, too, right? So there are a lot of things, a valid transaction that we want to like you know look out for you. <laughs> but what does that really mean? Like you know, with the so much of high volume transactions coming in. We started our journey with something saying, hey, like, let's start with a big data engineering tool, right? That's a common thing that comes into your picture. We started with an Apache, Apache Spark as well. So we started there, we implemented a couple of use cases, and pretty soon we started seeing an, a pretty big headache, like a headache of the managing the infrastructure, headache of like, you know, the cost going up, right? And a headache of like you know just the complexity of the managing the jobs failure the monitoring and you know, so on, and then we really started thinking like you know is the Apache Spark the right tool for the job, right? We really needed something a big data engineering tool, but also does it have to be a Spark by any sense, right? So that's where like you know we started looking into another possible services, and that's nothing but the model driven architecture, right? So the it's been very popular. It was there. But then, like we started saying, how can I actually use an MDA and like you know, connect that with an AWS infrastructures, and whether can I actually use that to replace my Apache Spark? Right. So that's that's an uh, uh, pretty much. So we actually started uh, thinking in that term, and we brought in a Lambda as a microservice, and then the Kinesis as a message bus. Right. That's a simple two components stitched together, but then like you know, it pretty much like you know, can work pretty powerful uh, uh, in the sense too. So what does that really mean? Like you know, we had a Spark infrastructure, and uh, minimum we had like you know, let's say even a minimal minimal configuration, Spark needs around three masters, minimum three worker nodes, and let's say like you know, you have some uh, cluster manager that's under add under three servers to this, and let's say like you know, you need somewhere to connect to the jobs because you don't want to have a big jobs running. So that may be like you know, let's say a Kafka connector, and uh, Ended up like you know pretty soon around 12 servers, right? Now for 12 servers, what's the cost involved? And when you compare that cost with let's say the serverless streaming architecture, pretty much the cost we are talking about is one tenth of the overall cost of what we were actually paying for us Apache Spark. Yes, sir, you heard it right. It's a one tenth of the cost of like you know the Apache Spark, right? So then we said, okay, like you know we might have to look at what else is involved. And uh, pretty soon, like you know, some of the important features, like really need to be available all the time. 
which means like you know i need to also make it not only in one region replicate the same thing to the second region as well too so now let's talk about like you know 12 server now multiplied into the second uh, and the 12 servers right think about all the devops complexity it actually brings to this and so on and pretty soon like you know the cost starts adding up one of the biggest thing that we also saw is like you know let's say if i am actually making an an uh, an io call to enhance my data and if that io call is going to take a second to respond the spark allocates one core per thread now if my io call is going to like you know be running at around let's say 100 100 transactions per second i'm pretty much like you know reserving 100 core machines which means like you know my my server cost is really going to like you know shoot up and at the same time the utilization actually goes down right so but whereas like you know with respect to the lambda i it's just pay per use and then like you know i can just keep waiting it's what like you know a uh, couple of seconds like for thousands of uh, lambdas so that's how like you know the cost drastically goes down when it comes to the uh, spark versus this one same with in development and uh, operation cost right so you know, with respect to the spark you need a specialized knowledge you need to be able to uh, fine tune the jobs you need like you know good amount of knowledge on that as well you need to learn a different uh, uh, technology skill set as well too but whereas when it comes to the lambda it's an polygot right you don't have to worry about the infrastructure you don't have to worry about like you know how they are actually connected together all you need to worry about is your business logic that's been implemented and getting into the resiliency like you know i uh, briefly touched upon the multi region and if i do have to like you know make it happen across the multiple regions it's a big headache like you know how do i actually sync these two spark clusters what happens like you know active passive means what about like you know if it is in passive am i going to keep my servers running all the time and so on right so that's essentially like you know adds up to but whereas when it comes to the lambda pretty much i can keep my vestat running and basically the different region running i don't have to pay for anything as long as like you know messages are not going so if, particularly if it is an active passive kind of configuration so then like you know, you're really not paying for this uh, multi region resiliency until the actually the second region is required right so that actually like you know pretty soon uh, uh, adds up the cost too <coughs> so i talked about this serverless streaming what is this serverless streaming really is all about though in nutshell it, it's a combination of a Uh, a careful orchestration of a lambda and a kinesis right so when i say careful orchestration of the lambda and kinesis like you know a lambda becomes a, a smaller possible unit of work good at doing only one thing and then because you are not paying by like you know the uh, hours or so like you know you are just paying by the amount of memory used amount of time it's actually being used and number of instances that are being done so it's actually you are more motivated to do it small things at a time right so if you start building those lambdas as small as possible now they are also being reusable for example like you know a kafka connector there here all it does is like you know reads from the kafka puts it in the kinesis right if i build something like this i can just use this kafka connector for any number of use cases all i have to do is make that kafka topic as a configurable credentials as a configurable and make everything that is, that changes a configurable and hence like you know any other use case can just like pull from repository and you know use it right so like that i can keep building like you know multiple reusable entities uh, in that sense and similarly like you know flows right let's say i built a streaming solution and tomorrow if i want to actually support an api on top of it all i have to do is like you know put an api gateway throw in a rest api connect back to the same kinesis right so my whole flow gets reused in this case so that's that's how like you know it actually helps us to Uh, build more configurable as well as like you know, reusable flows on to that right so let's let's talk about like you know why we really use then lambda and then uh, uh, kinesis on this thank you vijay so uh, as as we have seen like in this pattern there are only a two two main component right in the message driven architecture one is a microservices another one is a message bus so let's talk about what is the reason why we cho choose a lambda there are lots of other uh, services available managed services in the uh, aws or other cloud provider which can give us this capability but let's talk about uh, it right so when we are looking into the microservices we are looking into the certain features so that it is easy to maintain easy to scale easy to monitor right because when we are designing the architecture we want to make sure that it can scale well also it is easy to maintain we don't want to put like lots of effort to maintain it 
as well as it supports the different uh, monitoring capabilities there, right? So those are the fundamental reason uh, where we thought that the Lambda uh, fits a base to our requirement. Though it had some of the shortcomings, we'll talk about how we overcome that. Uh, but because of some of this feature, like it is a managed service, it has lots of out-of-box integration with the other AWS service provider. This, uh, the scaling capability is uh, fantastic there. Uh, we only pay per run. We don't pay if you're not using it. Uh, and then uh, it also supports the multi-language. So I think all those benefits were, were the, the, the reason why we fundamentally choose the Lambda there, right? So now let's talk about the second piece of our architecture, which is nothing but the message bus. Uh, so in the message bus, we are looking for something where we can process the data and we, where we can isolate two microservices uh, using the message bus. And that is where we look into the different services available uh, in the AWS environment, and then we uh, narrow it down to the kinesis. There are a bunch of the reasons why we selected the kinesis, but here uh, there are a few of them. Uh, we can talk about like uh, uh, the more uh, offline or at our booth. Uh, but I think the fundamental reason why we selected the Kinesis is uh, it is a very high throughput managed service. It supports around uh, 2,000 transactions per second. If you count the one transaction as a one kilobyte uh, of the message, it supports around 2 Mbps of the uh, bandwidth there. That was the one reason. Uh, it is very well integrated with the, uh, with the Lambda. And when you combine the Lambda and Kinesis, you enable uh, lots of other features which you required in your streaming application, which will uh, uh, look into the next upcoming slide. Uh, it can also scale, because the, the way it is connected to the Lambda, it is like per shard, you'll get the Lambda concurrency. So when you scale uh, the Kinesis, it's also very easy to scale your entire solution. Um, it also has a retry mechanism. It, it works on a very similar fundamental as the Kafka or other distributed queues, where you have the checkpoints ability and all those, and then you can uh, you can you can uh, keep track of the messages there. So uh, the next thing is like when we are building the solution, we said okay, how we can uh, divide or how we can uh, design in such a way that it will be very easy to develop within the capital one. So we divide it into the two fundamental two two different portion of it. One is a reusable function, other one is the SDK or the libraries. Uh, let's talk about the reusable functions. As Vijay mentioned earlier, also the reusable function is nothing but you can have any function. You can just configure it and start using it. We divided that into a three main category, the source, processor, and kinesis, uh, and the sync. Source is nothing but from where the data is coming. Processor is in between layer where you'll have your application-specific logic. And the sync is nothing but uh, the destination of your messages, right? So for one of the example of the source here can be the S3 file, right, or the SQS where uh, the messages are coming into your stream. Uh, the processor are nothing but, let's say, the filter, transform, and all those. So let's say if you identify that, OK, this message you want to process next or not, so that becomes the filter. Uh, the, so that is an example of the processor. And sync is nothing but where is, where is your uh, data is going. The second portion uh, where we work on, we build our SDKs. So SDK is nothing but like we wrap, uh, we abstracted certain functionality, the repetitive functionality, into the library so that the developers who are developing it, they don't need to focus on all those repetitive functionality. So we added the certain features into the SDK. Uh, the first one is the read and write from the Kinesis. So the way we abstracted out uh, the reading and writing from the Kinesis is that as a developer, when they, are de when they are developing their business application, they don't need to worry about how to write, read the message from the Kinesis or how to write it to the Kinesis as a part of the next destination, right? Um, and that way, we also abstracted uh, the AWS-specific uh, functionality there. And the way we have built, like you can just see uh, uh, what the message is coming and how the developer can access it. The second feature of, uh, was the exception handling and retries. Uh, if you guys have worked with this streaming application or distributed application, I think the one of the pain points there is how to, do the, uh, how to handle the exception or how to do the retries. So let's say if you are calling from your application, if you are calling any blocking IOs, and what will happen if that blocking IO is failing? Will you lose your message because it's a fast uh, uh, streaming application? It has around 1,000, 2,000 TPS. Whether you lose the message uh, or you handle it, and that is where we have implemented the exception handle and retries. Um, the secret management, uh, though like the Lambda, in, in Lambda environment parameters, you can have your credentials stored. Uh, and you can also encrypt it, but we feel that it's very easy from the uh, console to decrypt it. So 
so that is where we build the integration with our uh, our own develop secret uh, management service where the developer can store that secrets uh, for the application and when the container will start it will uh, get that secrets from there the other one is like the monitoring and logging uh, so uh, logging like yeah, you, it it has the cloudwatch functionality but it we added some other functionality which we'll talk about into the upcoming slide the other one which we focus on on the message due duplication uh, many times we have seen in like let's say spark or other distributor or other fast data system um, it guarantees most of the time uh, the at least one guarantee of the message right um, and uh, because of that many times you may get the duplicate message so the idea here is can we uh, can our sdk listen each the ma each of the messages and based on the configuration of the unique parameter in your message can it filter it out uh, using the caching or key value key value storage database right uh, that is what we implemented so that way uh, as a developer they just need to configure what is the unique parameter about that message and then give the uh, key value store or the caching uh, database which can help to reduce the messages same with the region uh, resiliency so now let's talk about like how how it, it is getting scaled right so fundamentally if we see what is the scaling scaling is nothing but when you have this spike in your application load how you can provide the more resources so that it can handle that spike right so it's it can be horizontal or vertical scaling um, so here uh, if you see that way uh, we, there are two main component into this architecture one is the kinesis and lambda uh, so the idea is can somehow if if we identify that how much messages are there into the kinesis then we can scale uh, up or down right and i think that is the one very powerful feature when you connect the kinesis to the lambda you get the one matrix call iterator age so iterator age is nothing but it shows the depth of the message how old message you are processing right and i think that is the one key reason based on which you can scale the messages for other solutions that is the one of the tricky point or challenging area there and based on the cloudwatch alarm on that matrix you can scale the kinesis charts and it can scale your lambda uh now let's talk about how we do the logging right so because in the fast data application when we're designing it the one fundamental things which we wanted was how we can track track each and every one of our message and how we can identify that what is happening with the message so what we did was like uh, there is also cloudwatch logs available but let's say if you, if, if you uh, don't uh, uh, like feel comfortable with the cloudwatch log ui uh, and if you have your own logging solution you can think of something like this where uh, you can have one reusable lambda whose functionality will only be like listening from the cloudwatch logs the you listening the event from the cloudwatch logs or from the kinesis and then forwarding that logs to your own monitoring service provider right so for example splunk uh, you know, kibana or anything like that right now uh, and while well, you also get the sns notification on top of your all the cloudwatch metrics around the kinesis and lambda so that also you can use as a part of uh, your monitoring capability Okay. so this is the one of the way you can do the uh, monitoring that so now let's uh, talk about like how it is where the spark is better so so basically like you know, we talked about a lot of good things about the serverless streaming right what does that really mean like you know does that mean like it's a silver bullet and can solve everything i think that's that's not what we are really talking about so right so what you are saying is like you know there is an uh, uh, a place like you know where a serverless streaming can do much better which is primarily with respect to the event driven architecture right what happens in the event driven architecture is like you know you are getting most of the data from a single source right because you are getting from a single source you are not really using the power of a distributed computing in this case so what does the spark offers like spark sends all that logic to like you know the multiple nodes it takes the benefit of the distribution into the into the picture right whereas in case of the streaming you really are getting all the data from a single source in this case like you really are not distributing that one too right that's the biggest difference between both of these approaches now if you do have a, a use cases like you know where you need to actually read lot of different sources lot of different files maybe like you know apply some map map and filter and reduce and you know so on and then want to like you know bring the result back or aggregate the results back you should actually go for the spark because there like you know you are actually using the power of the distributed computing in this case right 
So the, the, the typical use cases are like, you know, large file processing. Uh, the batch file processing is the other thing. Machine learning use cases with uh, other things too, wherein like, you know, you might have to like, you know, apply the repeated logic, yeah, the different kind of permutation and combination, and then you calculate it, results on top of the results, you want to again recalculate it, right? So in such cases, like, you know, you can distribute the data, distribute the function, and apply those things, calculate, and then collect the results back. So that's where, like, you know, the Spark is really powerful at, right? And that's where, like, you know, you need to find out, like, what that use case is all about, and then, like, pick and choose based on that one. Now, uh, the Spark is also, like, you know, seems to be an, uh, playing well in a real-time streaming use case, too. But their benchmark is around million TPS. Right now, like, as I talked about at the initial, even with a minimal configuration, you need around 12 to 13 servers, right? Now, if it is purely a streaming configuration without a blocking I.O., with the 12 servers, you might be able to, like, you know, easily handle, like, you know, at least 5,000, 6,000 TPS, right? But think about, like, you know, does your use case really has, like, 5,000, 6,000 TPS? Or, like, maybe million TPS, right? How, now, how many of your use cases, like, you know, really run with a low TPS? Right? So that might be like why you want to actually determine whether you want to actually spend all, all that money on the infrastructure, AWS cost, maintenance, overhead, and monitoring, and so on, or versus like you, know, you want to go with a simplified option where you don't have to deal with any of those infrastructure, but you are easily able to handle 8,000, 9,000 TPS, which, is, which fits into most of our use cases as well. Too. That, um, Thank you for like you know stopping by, and uh, if you do have any any further questions, like we do have a booth here just right across the board at the Capital One. Uh, happy to discuss. Again, like we are just here to share our success stories on uh, serverless uh, solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys.